Good evening, everybody. Um, glad to, to be with all of you and um, hope that I can provide some information that's that's helpful for you or, you know, and for your life, loved ones. Um, as Mallory said, my name is Janice Minert. Um, I am with, I'm a paralegal, also a master level social worker um, with the Pennsylvania Health Law Project. Um, and so I'm going to just talk quickly about the Health Law Project in case folks um, are not familiar with us um, and just give you a quick, you know, in a nutshell overview so you have a sense of who we are, what we do, um, and when you may need to reach out to us. Um, so the Pennsylvania Health Law Project is a statewide nonprofit law firm, and our work focuses on helping people access publicly funded health care um, coverage and services. And so when we say publicly funded, we are primarily talking about Medicaid or what in Pennsylvania we call medical assistance. They're the same thing. Um, to a lesser extent, we help people with Medicare, often those who have both Medicare and Medicaid. Um, and we help uh, parents with kids who might be eligible for CHIP, the Children's Health Insurance Program. So we, um, th there's, you know, kind of a couple different buckets of what we do, um, but our direct client work, whether it's with the client themselves or, um, I'm sorry, I think I did that, um, or somebody calling on the individual's behalf, uh, we operate a helpline. Um, currently that, op that helpline functions on Mondays and Wednesdays beginning at 8 a.m., um, and people can call and ask, you know, for help or information about anything related, related to Medicaid, Medicaid waiver programs um, that we're going to talk about tonight, um, people who have both Medicare and Medicaid or perhaps have one insurance and then are becoming eligible for the other. That gets tricky and, and um, challenging to navigate when people have both of those insurances. Um, and people can also call us when they have service denials with Medicaid. Um, so perhaps people have already, you know, been determined eligible, they're on Medicaid, but are now having either difficulty accessing services because they're just not sure maybe what to do, who to call, um, or a service has been recommended or prescribed for um, an individual and Medicaid often is the case, Medicaid health plan um, denies that service. And so we can help people with those, um, all those various issues. We can provide advice. We can actually um, represent people in appeals, uh, troubleshoot and deal with issues at um, in terms of Medicaid eligibility with the county assistance office. Um, we have lots of written materials um, on our website. And I apologize, that's not up here. It's PHLP. Dot org. Um, lots of written materials, you know, sometimes those are things we send people and, you know, all of which is also accessible on our website. Um, and then, uh, and we do public education kinds of things like tonight. Um, and then we also, from our direct client work, uh, do a lot of policy advocacy with the state, primarily the state Medicaid office. Um, so we have various ways to, to do that advocacy. Um, and so for issues that come through our helpline or come to any of us as case handlers directly, you know, it helps us troubleshoot um, potential problem areas within the whole system. And so then we work with the appropriate state officials to, you know, to try to improve the program or fix problems. Um, so uh, anybody can call our helpline um, if it's related to Medicaid or Medicaid and Medicare, um, whether it's eligibility or accessing services, again, in, including Medicaid home and community-based waiver services, chances are we're the right folks to call. And we, we do help people across the state. Um, the vast majority of what we do is, is by phone, and, and we're able to really be very successful at helping lots of people, you know, just button over the phone, email, et cetera. Um, so if um, if we we also have a monthly newsletter, folks might be interested in that, just send an email to the email there, staff at phlp.org. Um, let us know 
you know, just give us your name, um, the email that you want, you know, whether it's the one you email us from or a different one, um, and then you'll get an electronic version of our of our newsletter. Those also are also posted on our website um, as well, you know, the, all of the archives as well. Um, so let, um, let's move on. We're, we're going to um, talk first about Medicaid eligibility. Um, complicated in, in and of itself, unfortunately. Um, okay. So um, there are primarily four ways for, you know, for kids, young adults to be determined um, eligible for Medicaid. Um, up to at least the age of 19, um, kids can be determined eligible for Medicaid based on their household size and, and the household income. So whether that's with parents, guardians, you know, wherever, you know, whoever the individual might live with, um, they may be eligible, you know, just based on what's the household size and what's the income of the household. Um, and the rules can get tricky and, and nuanced in terms of who's in the household, you know, and, and whose income counts. Um, so that it's not literally household because, you know, perhaps I'm an 18 year old living with, you know, my parents and my grandparent is there. That grandparent's not gonna be counted in the, in the household. People can also be eligible, both kids and adults for Medicaid by being determined disabled through the Social Security Administration and being determined eligible to receive a social security check, specifically an SSI check, supplemental security income. So people can have various, you know, um, forms of income from social security, like a social security retirement income, um, but it is SSI specifically. When somebody's receiving SSI, no matter the monthly amount of that check, that automatically means they have Medicaid. And so security actually communicates that information to the Medicaid office um, so that somebody doesn't even have to um, enroll in Medicaid. Um, when kids up to the age of 18 don't qualify for Medicaid in either of those above categories, they can be eligible based on having a disability or significant health issue. Um, that's known as um, or categorized really as the PH95 category. Uh, and sometimes people refer, refer to that as the loophole category. Um, but that way for kids to be determined possibly eligible for Medicaid um, ends at 18. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about you know, what might happen to kids who have Medicaid, you know, up until that point. Um, and then the, the other way that kids could be eligible for um, Medicaid is if they're receiving home and community-based waiver services. Um, home and community-based waivers are a group of services that various groups of people could potentially be eligible for in addition to being able to then access the services that might be a part of that individual waiver. And we're going to talk more about this later. Um, that person also then automatically gets Medicaid, full Medicaid health insurance, in addition to receiving services, you know, that, that, um, that they need and are eligible for through the waiver. Um, we're also going to talk specifically tonight about um, a, another specific category of medical assistance, um, two actually, that are related, medical assistance for workers with disabilities. Um, that, that's a category that begins for young teens, really, at the age of 16. Okay, so just to give an example, you know, in terms of that first way that people could be, kids could be eligible and teens could be eligible for medical assistance, you know, based on household size and income. So just using, you know, one example here, the age of the child matters because the younger the child, the higher the income limit to 
to be eligible for Medicaid. Um, so, you know, and again, this is just one example, you know, of a household of four. Obviously, the household could be smaller or larger. Um, but in, in based on 2023 Medicaid income limits, you know, you can see a household of four, that newborn or one-year-old would have to have income under 5,500, one to five-year-old under 4,050 a month, and six to 18-year-old um, less than $3,450 a month. And, and under this category of Medicaid, and this is not true of every category, under this category of Medicaid, we're just looking at household size, household income. Um, for that individual who's applying for or somebody's applying for Medicaid for them. Um, resources, assets uh, are not counted. So it doesn't matter if, you know, that, you know, parent of, say, 17-year-old um, has money in a checking account, a retirement account, you know, owns a couple vehicles, may even own a house or more than one house. None of those resources count when we're looking at this category of medical assistance. And then these income limits um, go up usually every year, um, calendar year. Typically by about the third week in January, we know, and these, the, these income limits are all based on the federal poverty level. That is, as the name implies, gets determined at the federal level. Okay. And then, as I said, um, individuals, both kids and adults, who apply for an SSI check through Social Security are determined eligible based on having a disability and based on Social Security also looks at household income and, and, and household assets. Um, but once somebody is determined by Social Security that they're eligible for SSI check, they get a monthly check from Social Security and, as I said earlier, medical assistance or, or Medicaid insurance. Um, you know, so that and that's up to uh, I mean, that's true of all all kids. But in terms of, you know, kids and adults, kids under 18 um, for Social Security's purposes, the parents and the child income, if the child has any, and resources count in determining the SSI eligibility for, for, for a kid under the age of 18. Once a child is 18 or older, then the parent or guardian's income and assets no longer count in determining whether that now 18-year-old might be eligible for SSI and therefore eligible for Medicaid as well. Um, so, and, and Social Security is not our area of expertise. It's, it's the Medicaid, as I said. Um, but, you know, it, and I think it, it is, you know, important for families to know that if at some point you applied for your child, your under 18-year-old child for an SSI check, and they were determined ineligible because of family income or you know parents income parents resources when that child turns 18 depending of course on what's going on with the child's health or disability then that's the time to consider reapplying for SSI because now they're just going to look at that you know what's by social security definition is considered adult that 18 year old and you apply, you know, online or at, at a social security office for that benefit. Okay. And then, as I said earlier, you know, kids up to the age of 18 can be eligible for Medicaid, just no matter parents' income, you know, or, and, and, or assets. Um, so kids are up to the age of 18 are always screened first for that category, that first category, where you look at household size, household income. Kids that are eligible under that category then get Medicaid, you know, under that category. If, you know, the, the child's household size, you know, or household income is over the income limit for the household size, but that, you know, child or young adult, you know, teen, has um, 
a, dis a documented disability or a medical condition, then they could be eligible for Medicaid, you know, re regardless of the parent's, you know, income. Um, but again, this changes at, at age 18. You know, if your child's getting Medicaid under this category, then this category ends at age 18. So sometimes families know, we talked to, you know, tons of families, and sometimes they know, they know how their child was determined eligible for Medicaid. Um, many times people don't, because it isn't anything that people are told. You know, people apply, they apply with a paper application or online, they provide all the documentation that the county assistance office requires, that application gets processed, and then in the case of when somebody's determined eligible, you know, the system then doesn't, you know, say in this case to parents, you know, your child's been determined, it, it's yes, they're eligible for Medicaid or no, they're not. And if they're not, there has to be a reason and an appeal right. Um, but nobody, you know, it's just not part of the process for somebody to then say to the parents, oh, and so, you know, you know, your child qualified, you know, under such and such category. Um, so, but as you're, if your child's on MA and getting close to 18 and you're not sure what category, cause, and, and, and kids can go back and forth between categories, remembering again that the first category to be reviewed is the one having to do with household size, household income. Well, of course, you know, the, the nature of families is you know, the household size and income can change. Incomes go up, they go down. You know, a parent is single, then a parent's married. There, you know, there was three of us. Now there's a new baby. Now there's, you know, four of us. Um, so, you know, so again, it, it's not even, you know, I've talked to parents over the years who thought, you know, oh, well, yeah, my child gets Medicaid in that, you know, PH95 category. And then we have access to the Medicaid eligibility system. We look them up and we see that's not how they're currently in Medicaid, you know, and, and we can go backward in the system and I can see, oh, yes, they were, you know, a year ago or two years ago. Um, so it really does help as, you know, as your, your youth gets closer to the age of 18, if you're not already sure, well, you know, yes, I know my child has Medicaid because they get an SSI check or I do know based on our household size and income that, you know, they definitely are getting Medicaid under that PH95 category. But if you don't know, it's helpful to know that, you know, before your child turns 18, um, because, you know, it, it's going to make a difference because this category ends at 18. And then for Medicaid purposes, you know, families want to look at, well, are, are there other ways my child might be eligible, including perhaps now applying for Social Security for SSI, because now Social Security is looking at your 18-year-old as an adult based on how Social Security defines, you know, an adult. Hey, Janice, we have a quick question in the chat. Sure. Um, from Mary Peterson. Um, if a child is adopted and came to the parents with MA, how do you know which category? Um, yeah, great question. And depending on um, depending on the adoption, um, it is is potentially one factor. You know, some kids who who get adopted um, get Medicaid up until at least their 18th birthday uh, because of the nature of the adoption. You know, uh, other kids you know, could have perhaps been on Medicaid based on where they were living or who they were living with, you know, what was their household and household size and income. Um, and then that, you know, doesn't necessarily, you know, that doesn't necessarily carry over then into now the adoptive family. Um, but, it, you know, you, you can, um, I mean, you really, you can call the county assistance office um, or, you know, or a customer service center, because often it's difficult to even get somebody at the, you know, at the county assistance office um, to find out, um, 
you know, just exactly what category does my, you know, does my kid have Medicaid in? Um, people can also um, feel free to reach out to me. It's a really very quick, almost always I can do it with the child's name and date of birth. Sometimes that doesn't work and I need actually a, so the child's social security number and date of birth, but I, we could, I can go in and look at that. Um, it's, you know, quick. Somebody can just give me a call or shoot me an email and I'm, I'm glad to look them up because everybody's got a code and then we've got the cheat sheet for what that code means. Um, and, and if we don't automatically know the code because we're so familiar with it, we can look it up and then be able to tell, you know, yes, based on how the child's coded, they're getting Medicaid, you know, because of um, an adoption. Awesome. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, and um, and and then kids, as I said, can also be eligible and adults can be eligible for Medicaid by be, by becoming eligible for home and community based waiver programs. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about those waiver programs. Um, the, the various waiver programs have different eligibility criteria, and we're going to get into to those waivers and the various um, clinical eligibility criteria. And then the waivers all also have income limits and resource limits. The resource limit and the income limit is the same no matter which waiver program somebody's you know, applying for in, in Pennsylvania. Um, the income for the income limit is based just on the applicant's income. So it doesn't count, you know, it doesn't count any parents if the person's married. It does not count the spouse's income for for medic for the Medicaid waivers. Um, the income limit for 2023 for um, all of Pennsylvania home and community-based waiver programs is $2,742 a month. Um, and then there is a resource limit with waivers as well. That resource limit is, is $8,000. Um, and you know it's $8,000 for a single uh, person applying. If that person is married, then, um, then it's a little more complicated uh, you know, in terms of um, you know, what the resource limit is, but, but the resources of the spouse do count. Um, and again, you know, if, if somebody's not on already on Medicaid, when they apply for one of the home and community-based waiver programs and are determined eligible, then they also get full Medicaid insurance. And we're going to talk more about the waivers. Okay. So things to kind of think about as, um, you know, as, as kids are getting, you know, closer to 18, for sure. And, and even earlier, depending on um, child's diagnoses and, and needs, um, especially where some of the waiver programs are concerned. But, um, you know, kids who are, um, you know, 18 and older, you know, can apply as as we I mentioned earlier for a Social Security benefit for SSI Supplemental Security Income, and at that point, Social Security is not looking at parents' income. You know, they, if that eighteen year old happens to be married, they are going to look at the spouse's income, but otherwise, they're you know for um, determining financial eligibility for SSI. They're looking just at any income or lack thereof that the 18-year-old has. Um, and then the Social Security is also then applying the adult standards of disability. That's when that switch occurs. So kids under the age of, of 18 who are determined eligible for SSI you know, based on being both income eligible and clinically eligible because of health conditions or disabilities, you know, that criteria for, you know, what's referred to as the childhood, childhood listing of impairments, that's a different set of criteria once the child turns 18. 
now the the criteria is looking at not only the the child's health this 18 year old health conditions or disabilities you know they're also looking at the the potential for work and being employable before age 18 whether or not you know the 15 or 16 year old is you know with the health condition is employable is not a factor in social security's determination it becomes a factor once somebody's 18 and older um, so you know again helpful to know how your almost 18 year old is getting medicaid because if that soon to be 18 year old is getting medicaid in that ph 95 category that category for kids with health conditions who get MA no matter the parent's income, that category ends at, at 18. So in addition to now that 18-year-old possibly being eligible for an SSI check, you know, a monthly social security check um, that, that would also then provide them with Medicaid, if parents don't want or the 18-year-old you know, doesn't want to apply for SSI, um, you know, perhaps because they're, you know, they're heading to college. They're not, uh, you know, with their health conditions or disabilities, they're, you know, they're not wanting to get SSI. They're wanting to ed get educated perhaps and be able to work, um, but still really need the health care. Then, you know, it's a matter of looking at well, then how, how else might this 18, now 18 year old be eligible, you know, for, for Medicaid, um, you know, kids 19 and older, um, parents income is no longer counted in, in determining Medicaid eligibility. Um, if the parents are no longer declaring that 19 year old or older, um, as a tax dependent. So again, you know, these are really good times to be calling us at the Health Law Project um, because this just can get so individualized for people. Um, you know, just deciding whether or not to keep declaring your 19 or 20 year old as a tax dependent obviously has tax implications. It has, and we're not experts on those things, but you know, we can at least help, you know, families look at, you know, what might be some pros and cons or be able to reach out to if they have a tax attorney or a tax accountant, you know, that helps them with those things to see, okay, if I stop declaring my 19 year old as a tax dependent, you know, now that he or she's 19, you know, wh what's that going to mean to us, you know, financially? you know, are we going to be paying more in income taxes? Um, you know, are we going to get less back? Or are we going to owe more? Um, but it's, you know, it might be a factor in, in trying to determine, you know, how your child's going to continue with Medicaid, if that's really important to your child's health and, and well-being at that point. Um, and then, as I touched on earlier, the other option to consider for you know, an 18 year old and, and older, um, and really this category of MOD, medical assistance for workers with disabilities starts at age 16 um, through age 64. Um, then, it, you know, if that child is working or potentially could be doing some type of paid work, then this might, you know, that might be the way to get the child or on Medicaid or keep them on Medicaid if, for example, they're in that PH95 category that's ending when they turn 18. Okay. So looking just specifically at MOD, again, stands for Medical Assistance for Workers with Disabilities. And so as the name implies, people have to be both working and disabled to qualify for Medicaid under this category. They have to be between the ages of 16 and through age 64. Once somebody turns 65, they've aged out of this category. Um, they have to be doing, they have to be working some type of paid work, including informal work. So it doesn't have to be, 
you know, I'm going to um, wherever, you know, Dunkin' Donuts to work, you know, with a typical paycheck and I have pay stubs to prove my work. It could be something informal. It could be something that, you know, that this person is doing for a neighbor, a relative, a friend. Um, it just has to be something they're doing, you know, as predictable as anybody's job is in terms of, you know, guarantees, um, but something that they're, you know, expected to keep doing at least once a month, for example, and getting paid to do it. And if it's informal work, then they're, they, they're getting that documented simple letter from the person who's employing them. You know, I, I Janice Minard, am, am employing my neighbor, Mallory Hudson. She is providing child care for me, just making something up. She does that twice a month. I pay her $20 a month. Um, I sign it. I put my address, my phone number on there. So if the county assistance office wants to verify that, yes, I am employing Mallory, they can call me. I say, yes, that's exactly correct. What I wrote, she's, you know, provides babysitting child care for me. Um, it's at least twice a month and I pay her $20. Um, so, you know, work that's more formal or typical kind of job, or it could be something like that, something much, you know, dog walking. It could be any number of things, um, just so the person's doing it, getting paid to do it, and the person who's paying them is willing to put that in a couple sentences in a letter. Um, so Maud is working at, with disabilities. So the person's either receiving Social Security Disability Insurance, SSDI, a, a different form of Social Security check. Um, that checks the box then. They've been determined disabled by Social Security. Therefore, they meet that disability, but they don't have to be getting Social Security Disability to be determined disabled. So in that case, then with the MOD application or the Medicaid application, the person would wanna just provide documentation of their health conditions or, you know, or their disabilities. Um, perhaps it's an individual with autism and they have, um, you know, they have a recent um, assessment perhaps that's been done, or they have the documentation from even a year or two ago that shows, you know, this is when I was diagnosed and here's the clinician who made that diagnosis. And, um, you know, so it doesn't need to be a stack of, you know, medical records. Um, but it also needs to be more than just, you know, the PCP writing on a little script kind of piece of paper. You know, Janice Minard is my patient. She has autism. That's not quite enough. Um, the person has to have, again, income limit for 2023. They have to have countable income, um, less than $3,038 a month. Um, I'm double checking that just because I... Um, yep, that's right. That just seemed high. <laughs> um, and then, and they have to have resources less than $10,000. So in this category of Medicaid, different from some others, um, resources do count. And by resources, we're talking mostly liquid resources, meaning money in checking or savings or a retirement account. Um, you know, if I own a car, they're not counting that first vehicle. If I own my home, that resource isn't counted. Um, so both, you know, needing to be clinically eligible and then income eligible and then resource eligible. And and um, I just, I should add here, what is different about MOD and about the a new category of MOD that is, is kind of an extension of MOD, um, different than any other category of medical assistance, when people are determined eligible under this category, there is a monthly premium. So unlike every other category except MOD and MOD for people with workers with job success, as it's referred to, um, people do pay something towards their, um, you know, their Medicaid insurance, um, and and that premium is um, based on their countable income. Um, and we can talk a little bit about what, uh, you know, how they determine countable income and it's 5% of their countable income. So 
you know, somebody whose income might be $1,000 a month, their Medicaid, their MOD premium would be $50 a month. And they would need to, you know, pay that and keep paying it. Otherwise, they risk losing their, their Medicaid insurance. And then this is fairly new, a um, couple years now, but um, fairly new to the system to be implementing. There is also another MOD related category that is called MOD for workers with job success. And this category allows people who have been on MOD for at least 12 consecutive months to be able to earn more than that, you know, again, for a single person to earn more than $3,038 a month. Um, and once they've been on MOD for 12 months and now perhaps have an opportunity for a different job or a raise, something, you know, a second job, whatever it might be that puts them over that income limit, MOD's income limit is at 250% of federal poverty. Um, it's over 250% of poverty, but less than 600% of poverty, which is a very high income limit for a Medicaid program, then they, they can move into this MOD for workers with job success category, earn more money, a lot, potentially a lot more money. Their premium is higher. Instead of 5% of their countable income, the premium is 7.5%. Um, and once somebody moves into this category, because their income exceeded the MOD income limit, then there's no resource limit. So this really opens up for people. And, and this happened as a result of some really wonderful advocacy um, by, in large part, people with disabilities um, and, and advocates like ourselves and others, but um, really driven by, you know, by people with disabilities working who you know, with their disability or health condition, you know, were feeling limited about how much they could earn and keep their incredibly valuable medical assistance coverage. Um, and for some people, not just the medical assistance, but also getting home and community-based waiver services, services that literally help them get out of bed and get showered and dressed to get to work at jobs now that are, you know, paying even better than the 250% of poverty. Um, now, if people are on MOD for 12 consecutive months, they can earn more, they can no longer, you know, refuse a pay raise or, you know, not take that new promotion or new job opportunity because it would pay too much, put them over that income limit. Now people can not only earn a lot more, once they've moved into the MOD for workers with job success category, now they also are not limited to savings of $10,000. So now folks can be earning more, you know, and saving more and perhaps putting money in a retirement account, a 401k, a 403b, whatever it might be, um, and not be worried that they're going to lose their vital health insurance and again, for people getting waivers, lose those waiver services. So this is a um, it, it's a it's a wonderful thing Pennsylvania has done, and and every state does not have this category of medical assistance, neither MOD nor the MOD for workers with job success. Janice, when you're talking about countable income, is that gross pay or net pay? You know what, let me see. Ah, there we go. Perfect question. I, I sometimes forget what I have on my PowerPoint or <laughs> did I include it in this one or that one. Another great question for Mary Peterson. There you go. And perfect timing, um, Mary, because this is what when we say countable income, and it's really important to, to know this important distinction. <laughs> because, excuse me, because Countable income, first of all, income gets counted. It, and, and, and this is true of this mod, mod for workers with job success. It's also uh, true for the um, Medicaid 
disability category, um, what's referred to as healthy horizons. So it, it's not true for every way to get Medicaid. That's what makes this program so complicated. Um, but for MOD and for MOD for, with workers with job success, how income gets counted first depends on the source of the income. So is the individual applying have earned income, unearned income, or both? Earned income basically means from a job, wages. That's what the system means when they say earned income. Unearned income is things like Social Security, Social Security disability, Social Security retirement, um, workers' compensation, unemployment, um, you know, those all fall in the bucket of unearned income. So, and that earned income and that unearned income gets counted very differently in determining an individual's total countable income. So from the unearned income, start with the gross, let's say in this case, Social Security, and subtract $20. Otherwise, everything else of that Social Security check is counted when determining eligibility. From earned income, we're counting less than half. And so I always use simple, for me, simple <laughs> math examples, not for others, but it helps me. Um, so, so here's the example. Michaela has social security disability insurance. That monthly gross amount before anything might come out of her social security check, like maybe a Medicare premium, you know, her gross monthly amount is $14.20 a month. She's working, earning gross $6.65 a month. So what's her countable income for eligibility purposes for, for MOD? Um, all but $20 of her $14.20 gets counted. From her $6.65 earnings, the system subtracts $65 and then counts only half the remainder. So now we have $1,400 countable for her unearned income, $300 countable for her earned income. Add those together, her income, her countable income for Medicaid, for MOD, for this category is $1,700 a month. So if Michaela was trying to get Medicaid other than MOD, let's say just in that disability slash called healthy horizons category, the income limit for that category for 2023 is, let me say 12, you think I'd know it by now, 1215 countable income limit is $1,215 a month for a single person. So Michaela's way over that, even with those deductions, those big deductions on her earnings. We still, she still comes to 1700 countable. So her only option is, and it's a perfect option for her, assuming her resources are under $10,000, she's eligible for Medicaid under this mod category. And then her premium again is 5% of her countable income, not her real income. So 5% of that $1,700. Um, is $85 a month. So she then has full medical assistance coverage, you know, for $85 a month. Janice, and, we have another question in the yeah. chat from Michelle, mm -hmm. um, who asks, are funds in a commercial bank account that are ITF in the 18 plus adult child counted as resources when applying for SSI? You know, that's a little bit outside of our scope. But ITF meaning some type of trust fund. I don't know what an ITF is. It is some type of trust, but I'm not sure if it's necessarily a special needs trust. So Michelle, if you're not familiar with the special needs trust, those types of funds would not be counted. And also funds from like a PA ABLE account would not be counted, but there are lots of types of trusts that exist. Um, so you'd want to, I think you'd want to check and make sure See what kind of trust you're using. Exactly right. And again, so security not being our expertise, but even on the Medicaid side, um, 
So security rules and Medicaid rules on trusts may not completely align, um, but same same response that that Mallory gave. It's the devil's in the details. What kind of well, trust? We'll have a benefits counselor on for next week's webinar who's actually going to discuss that a little bit. So tune in next week. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and then, you know, just again to kind of wrap up this piece, but, you know, so in this example, Michaela's eligible for MOD. Hopefully her premium's affordable. It's $85 a month. And then, you know, if she's, you know, working, whether it's for at least 12 consecutive months or two years, however long, she's earning more, she's, you know, potentially even earning so much that she loses her social security disability um, because she's, despite whatever health or disability conditions, she's able to be really, you know, <laughs> employed and, and making a, a, a good living she then could then and you know move into you know as long as her resources stay under 10,000 her income goes up over that mod income limit her countable income then she can transition into mod for workers with job success earn more pay more for her premium but earn a lot have potential to earn a lot more and then no longer have a resource limit okay um, so if nothing else for the moment on, in terms of eligibility questions, we're going to talk more, a little bit more about once people have medic, medical assistance, Medicaid, um, how they access services and, and touch a bit on, you know, what, what can change for people. Um, and, and the change in this case isn't at age 18, it's at age 21. So that also gets confusing for people, um, because there's a difference about the eligibility rules versus the access to services rules once people have Medicaid. So most of, most of Pennsylvania's Medicaid system at this point is a managed care system. There are some exceptions um, and we're not really gonna get into the details of those exceptions. But so the majority of people who are determined eligible for Medicaid in Pennsylvania, once determined eligible, are then in a Medicaid managed care plan. Um, Pennsylvania's managed care system is bifurcated in that there are there's managed care plans for physical health services. Um, and there's also a separate managed care plan for behavioral health services. Um, so once somebody's determined eligible for Medicaid, then they're uh, assigned a behavioral health plan because they don't have choice of plan. That's determined by the county they live in. Um, but then they have a choice of their physical health plan. Um, and choices vary depending on whether they're in the Medicaid the managed care system that's called health choices or community health choices. Um, so for people who are in the Medicaid health choices managed care system, they have um, at least a choice of at least four physical health plans, depending on where they live, what county they live in. The counties are actually clustered in, into regions. Um, and I think there we go. So we have a, a map, you know, showing those regions. Um, so, you know, obviously, I mean, it's county dependent, but then, you know, depending on what county somebody's in, you know, they're in the health choices southeast region or the health choices northeast region. Um, and then the managed care plans available to people, the physical health managed care plans available to people in, in health Medicaid health choices um, is different depending on where they live. And again, can get confusing if you're in Butler County, but talking to your cousin in Venango County and you both have Medicaid and, you know, that Venango County cousin's telling you about one of the health plans and you're saying that's not even a choice. Well, yeah, it probably is in Venango in the Northwest region. Doesn't necessarily mean it's a choice in the Southwest region. Um, just Lots of complications. 
Um, and so here's the, the breakdown um, of available plans based on the region that, that somebody you know, on Medicaid lives in. Um, the lines through the plans, and at some point I'll just update this because we're now going to be, you know, a year past September of 2022. Um, but the plan, the health plans changed. These these health plans contract with the state Medicaid office, um, just like they can get the contracts, they can also lose the contracts. And so, with the last round of reprocurement for these contracts um, with the state Medicaid office. Some uh, some plans no longer had a contract um, in certain parts of the state. Aetna lost their contract in all of the state, and then some some plans moved into various parts of the state. So where you see the the um, plans in bold print, those are the plans that are new to that particular region. So you know today if you know, somebody in Dauphin County, which falls into the Lehigh Capital Zone, um, was determined eligible for Medicaid. They had Medicaid only. Um, they were not in a waiver. They did not have Medicare in addition to Medicaid. Then their Medicaid is in this health choices managed care system. And the, the plan choice, they have five plans to choose from. Um, and people want to choose those plans based on um, based on their providers in particular. So if you have a PCP and you love the PCP and the PCP only takes Gateway, um, which is now called Highmark Whole Care, um, or, you know, Geisinger, then chances are you want to enroll in the Gateway or the Geisinger plan in order to keep being able to see, um, you know, your PCP. Okay. And then, as I said, people's Medicaid behavioral health plan is determined by the county they live in. Um, that's because the county mental health and, and mental health and substance abuse services, um, the county office holds the contract with these managed care plans. Um, this, with state oversight, you know, there's always state oversight, but it's the counties that actually hold the contracts, they hire the plans, they can fire the plans. And, you know, and so, and occasionally you'll see those changes on the behavioral health side. Um, Delaware County, for example, um, just last year, I think, used to contract with Magellan Behavioral Health. They no longer do. They now contract with Community Care Behavioral Health. Um, so again, the, the behavioral health plan determined there is no choice and it's determined by the county where the person person lives. Okay. So some differences in um, services that are uh, available to people on Medicaid in Pennsylvania um, based on based on their age. And as I said, different than the eligibility, criteria where you really want to start to pay attention when your child's turning, getting close to age 18 for whether or not they're eligible for Medicaid. Once somebody's on Medicaid, then the difference in what services are available changes when, you know, th that person turns 21. Um, Medicaid generally is very good health insurance. It's very comprehensive, um, very small co-pays, and with the exception of MOD or MOD for workers with job success, there's no monthly premium. People are entitled to Medicaid if they are eligible, they're entitled to it. Um, and again, both for kids and adults, it's very good, very comprehensive coverage, small co-pays in the case of kids. And again, for these purposes, kids are now up to the age of 21. You know, they don't have any co-pays. Um, and, and that's tied to a federal Medicaid law, EPSTT, that stands for Early Periodic Screening Diagnostics and Treatment. And that federal Medicaid law, in a nutshell, says kids, 
and kids, again, for these purposes defined as up to age 21, kids get all medically necessary services under Medicaid. And so that means there are, you know, beyond the good coverage adults can get on Medicaid, there's even more benefits available. So for example, kids on Medicaid can get shift nursing, skilled nursing, home health aid, shift care. Um, it could be in the home, it could be in school, you know, otherwise even in the community. Um, that's, you know, that's a benefit that with the exception of perhaps being in a waiver program is not a Medicaid benefit for adults. So if, you know, if I'm an adult on Medicaid and, you know, I need, you know, skilled nursing care because of my health conditions, you know, three hours a day, every day, because of whatever my medical conditions are, Medicaid insurance, just the Medicaid will not, is not going to pay for that if I'm 21 or older. Um, and so, you know, for, for kids getting these services when they're under 21 and approaching 21, you know, it's important for, you know, families to be you know, paying attention and, and hopefully learning as folks may be for the first time tonight about, you know, oh, well, you mean that home health aid that my, you know, my kid's getting at, at, at home or in school 20 hours a week, 30, hour, 50 hours a week, whatever it might be, that won't continue once they're 21. No, not unless they're in a waiver. And even then, it you know, it depends on the waiver. Um, so, you know, so it, it, some important distinctions, um, around covered benefits, once people have Medicaid, if they're, you know, under 21 versus, you know, 21 and older, um, benefits for kids. And again, most, many of these are also available to adults on Medicaid. Um, and this is, you know, not a, you know, not of all inclusive list, but, you know, just as, as examples, you know, eyeglasses and hearing aids are covered for kids up to the age of 21. They're not covered for adults on Medicaid. Um, IBHS, intensive behavioral health services, what used to be called BHRS or referred to as wraparound behavioral health services. Those services end at, at the age of 21. There may be other kinds of behavioral health services available to a now 21 year old on Medicaid, but the IBHS services end when somebody is, you know, turns 21. Um, you know, it, orthodontia, not a covered benefits for adults. Dental benefits, kids have more comprehensive um, dental coverage than, than adults do on Medicaid. And again, you know, just some, you know, more examples of, um, you know, covered services. Um, again, and none of this is, is ex, you know, exclusive list. Um, and just within the last year, maybe two now, um, Medicaid also includes, um, without having a waiver, uh, wheelchair lifts, stair glides, ceiling lifts, um, various um, accessibility, you know, um, equipment for, you know, for people in, you know, in their home. Um, behavioral health services, again, for kids, even more comprehensive than what adults can get. Um, some of these services, you know, are also available to adults, you know, some aren't. Um, you know, again, the IBHS services, um, the residential treatment facility may or may not be something available to somebody 21, you know, and older. Um, ABA services, not covered unless somebody might be in like an autism waiver um, once that individual's 21 and, and still needs applied behavioral analysis, ABA, not, not otherwise a covered service for, you know, when you know, once kids turn 21. Um, so, you know, just some important age markers to pay attention to 
um, to know, you know, what changes could be coming. Okay. So, and I think I touched on most of this already, you know, just, and, and again, this list is not exclusive. I just was trying to think through, you know, and just highlight some of, you know, what, what's different, what's not covered when somebody's on, on Medicaid. And again, talking just Medicaid, the health insurance, um, we're going to talk more about the waivers and what they can and can't cover. Um, but here's, you know, just some of really kind of off the top of my head, what's not covered for adults um, 21 and older on, on Medicaid. Okay. Um, any questions up until this point, Mallory? Okay. Nope, you're good. Okay. All right. So, um, so then let's talk um, some about um, Medicaid home and community-based services. Um, for kids, you know, young youth, young adults, and actually uh, adults of, of any age. Um, so when, when we talk about home and community-based waiver services or home and community-based services, often just referred to as waivers, um, and often referred to as waivers because Medicaid law dictates from the federal level, you know, Medicaid law dictates you know, what kinds of services Medicaid or Medicaid insurance can pay for. But there can be some, you know, some of those rules around things that Medicaid does not cover can be waived if states approach the federal government and design programs that cover things above and beyond what Medicaid insurance covers. Um, and so that's, in a nutshell, what waiver programs are. Um, and waiver programs, no matter the different waivers, and we'll talk about some of them, excuse me, um, the, the point of all of the waivers, the kind of overarching goal of all the waivers is to help people with various health conditions or disabilities live in the community and not have to be in, in a nursing home or any other kind of institutional setting. Um, so that, that's the, the overarching goal of all of these programs, um, to help people live you know, their fullest, best life in the community, their place of choice, um, whether that's with family or with somebody else or independently on their own, um, and, and not in some institutional setting. So waivers can become really important um, for kids, young adults, when they turn 21, for the reasons we talked about earlier, that, you know, based on their health conditions or disabilities, there are perhaps, you know, needs that these now young adults have that were covered by Medicaid. You know, they were getting shift nursing or they were getting... And, and still need, you know, intensive behavioral health service or, or a home health aid because they need help with activities of daily living. You know, those things that are now no longer covered under just strictly Medicaid insurance because that youth is now turned 21 is potentially, th that help is now potentially available, you know, through a waiver program. Pennsylvania has different waiver programs for people with different disabilities. Three waiver programs for people with intellectual disabilities, an autism waiver. There is um, a waiver for people with physical disabilities and a waiver for people with developmental disabilities. And sometimes, you know, some overlap in there because, you know, none of us fit into some nice neat box of just having, you know, one issue or, and perhaps not, you know, not another. Um, most of Pennsylvania's waiver programs are not entitlements. Medicaid is an entitlement. Medicaid insurance is an entitlement program, meaning if you meet the eligibility criteria, you know, some of those criteria that we went over earlier in, in the beginning of, you know, of the webinar. If you are eligible for Medicaid insurance, 
then you are entitled to get it. The state, in com combined with the federal government, it's their job to figure out how the funding continues for any number of people at any point in time who might be in any given state entitled to Medicaid insurance. Most waiver programs, unfortunately, are not entitlement programs. And so that means there are X number of, X, there's X amount of funding that then leads to X number of slots available for people who at any given point in time in Pennsylvania can be receiving, you know, on that waiver and getting the services connected to that waiver program. Um, and unfortunately in, in Pennsylvania, and this has been the case for a very long time, the intellectual disability waivers and the adult autism waiver um, all have waiting lists. So the, the waivers, the intellectual disability waivers are for people who have um, a diagnosed intellectual disability. Generally, that means an IQ under 70, um, unless we're talking about, you know, younger kids like ages, you know, zero to eight, where it's often too soon even to determine whether or not there's, you know, a significant intellectual disability, um, but perhaps a high probability, you know, then they don't have to yet have to have that perhaps autism diagnosis or intellectual disability diagnosis. And for some people that it could be both. Once that individual's age eight or older, then in order to be um, looked at for any of these waiver programs and eligible, they have to in fact actually have a clinical diagnosis of an intellectual disability, a developmental disability or autism. And again, for some people they could overlap. So there I are- I have one thing to add there, Janice. Sure. Um, the Office of Developmental Supports recently published an update to that. So there's another like early age category. Um, so not just folks with developmental disabilities that may turn into autism or an intellectual disability later, but also folks with medically complex conditions that may cause later um, autism or an intellectual disability. Thank you. Thank you, Mallory. I appreciate Sorry, it. I should have let you know when I looked at this earlier. Completely yeah, yeah, no, 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 thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate that. And I need to add this. Um, so three intellectual disability waivers in Pennsylvania. The PFDS waiver stands for Person Family Directed Support waiver um, that offers a range of services, does not include residential supports or, or services. And that particular waiver is capped at $41,000 a year of, of, of services. So it could be one service, various services, but there's, a, there's an actual money cap on that. And again, waiver programs can have that in the way Medicaid insurance can't. You know, there's no such thing as, you know, well, I've, you know, I, I've overspent my Medicaid limit on Medicaid insurance, but they can apply to things like these waivers. Community living waiver it currently has a cap of $85,000 a year on services. The consolidated waiver, there is no cost cap. And so, as you can imagine, the consolidated waiver is predictably the one that is hardest for people to get to get into. Um, but for people who need, you know, residential, like a group home um, to live in, and for some people, a group home means I, I could be the only person in a group home. But for purposes of, you know, the, the waiver criteria, um, you know, I'm living in, in, you know, somewhere outside of my own home um, and, and getting often almost always 24 seven supports to, you know, to be living there. Um, and so people who are, you know, interested and, and potentially eligible for any of these ID waivers, that application process starts with the, the County Office of Intellectual Disability. And then when, you know, when the person's determined clinically 
eligible for an ID waiver. And again, kind of wait, you know, depending on age and what criteria that might might involve. Um, then there's an assessment done and an assessment tool that is used, often referred to as, you know, lots of acronyms in this system, referred to as the PUNS. Um, and that assessment tool helps determine, you know, how significant is this person's need right now? And, and how unmet might their needs be right now? Um, and that then helps to determine, you know, are they placed in, you know, the emergency category, the critical needs category, or the planning needs category. Um, and, you know, and th there is a Pennsylvania waiting list campaign. Um, I, I pulled the most recent numbers when I created this, you know, just probably a week or two ago. Um, but as you can see, you know, five, nine, you know, we have over what, 12,000 people across the state in these various, you know, categories. Um, and unfortunately, you know, we call it, for example, the emergency category that indicates somebody's needing services now or with it expected to be within the next six months, people could still sit on that emergency waiting list for a, a long time, too long, sadly. Um, and then Pennsylvania also has an adult autism waiver, again, one with a waiting list. Um, in order to, it, this waiver doesn't start till age 21, as the name adult, I think, implies. Um, the individual clinically must have a diagnosis of on the autism spectrum disorder. They may also have an intellectual disability disorder. Um, but they must have the autism diagnosis. Um, and so the adult autism waiver, you know, has various services, some services that are same with some of the ID waivers, some that are different, um, and various service providers that provide the services. Um, and so, you know, for, for some individuals, once they turn 21, you know, it, with an autism diagnosis, the adult autism waiver might be, you know, the one to um, to explore more. Um, people can also be on the waiting list for both the autism waiver and one of the intellectual disability waivers. Um, this waiver is not managed at the county level by the county ID offices the way the ID waivers are. This um, waiver gets managed at the state level through the Office of Developmental Programs. Um, and so that's and that's the phone number you know people would call um, to find out more information about this waiver um, and to find out um, you know like how to get on this um, what they call interest list, but it's essentially a, a waiting list. And then there are two other waiver programs um, in Pennsylvania. And also a third program that's not a waiver that can uh, provide supports to people. Um, so, and the these waivers and, and the two waivers in the Act 150 program um, are managed at the state level by the Office of Long-Term Living. Um, there is no waiting list for these two waiver programs. Um, one is the OBRA waiver. It's for individuals 18 and up. Um, with a developmental physical disability that occurred before and needs to be able to be documented that it occurred before the age of 22, um, you know, other than an intellectual disability. So, for example, somebody might have cerebral palsy, um, muscular dystrophy. Um, you know, those are some examples of, you know, a developmental physical disability um, that, that occurred before the age of 22. Um, that could have somebody then be clinically eligible for the, the OBRA waiver. Um, the Community Health Choices waiver, that waiver is for adults 21 and older. The clinical criteria for that waiver is that the person has to be determined nursing facility clinically eligible. And, and generally what that boils down to is that person needs to require assistance with 
things like bathing, dressing, mobility, toileting, um, whether tied to physical disabilities, it could be those things are even tied to things like dementia or a cognitive disability, um, but as a result of then needs, you know, assistance with bathing, dressing, toileting, medication management. Um, they additionally may also need help with things like cooking, cleaning, laundry, shopping, but to be eligible for the Community Health Choices Waiver, their primary needs first have to be help with bathing, dressing, mobility, toileting, um, eating, those kinds of things. Um, and again, no waiting list for the Community Health Choices Waiver. Um, and then Pennsylvania also has an Act 150 program. It's not a federal waiver, it's a state run as a result of Act 150 um, that is available for people age 18 to 59. Um, and generally for people who are either over the income limit for you know, the OBRA or the Community Health Choices Waiver or over the resource limit or both, um, but still, you know, still meet in the case of the CHC waiver, still meet the nursing facility clinically eligible standard. Um, and, and that program um, is facilitated through, um, generally through the, through the counties. Um, and depending, you know, on the part of the state, there are sometimes waiting lists for the Act 150 program. The Act 150, the services, the Act 150 program are primarily personal assistance services. Um, whereas the, all the other programs that are waivers have a, a really wide range of services. Uh, people apply for the OPER waiver and the Community Health Choices waiver um, through the the state's enrollment broker, which currently in Pennsylvania, the contract for that um, independent, uh, for the enrollment broker is Maximus. Um, and that process then starts first with the clinical assessment. And then if the person, you know, meets the clinical criteria for OBRA or the clinical crit criteria for CHC, um, then, you know, then they go through the financial eligibility piece um, and see if they're financially eligible. Um, and the county assistance office determines that. And again, with these two waivers, no waiting list. Janice, we have a question from Lynn Yocum. She says, how can we get information on which services, providers, and budget is available for over waivers prior to talking with, you know, particular service coordination agencies. They're trying to evaluate whether um, an individual would be more appropriate for an ID waiver or an OBRA waiver, but they can't get a lot of information and are trying to figure out who to contact. Personally, I look at the waiver application, but that's like a 300 page document. <laughs> right, right. But there is at least a kind of a starting point, more of a cheat sheet if, um, it, you know, if you just, if you go on the, the state's, you know, websites and really, you know, for most of it, like PA consolidated waiver or PA OBRA waiver, it pretty well pulls it up. You're, you're looking for a DHS, you know, a, a website that starts with DHS, Department of Human Services, um, PA, Department of Human Services. Um, and it, it'll pull up those various waiver pages and at least gives you kind of the starting point in terms of like the list of services. Um, there aren't any definitions there with those list of services. So some, you know, could be more intuitive than others just by the name of the service. Others, it's not as clear. Like, well, what is this? You know, what is job coaching? We can guess it has to do with employment, right? But then what is that exactly? Uh, but that that's at least a place to start initially. Um, and then, um, then in terms of, this is a really great question and one so far that I've not found a good, a good source for. Um, but then in terms of, okay, you know, let's look at OBRA waiver versus, you know, perhaps an ID waiver or, um, you know, you know, even the community health choices waiver. 
um, you know, who are the providers of those services? Um, to my knowledge, there's there's no easy place to find that that information, um, which I think is yeah problematic. You know, to try to figure out, um, you know, you know who are, who are the providers of these services to then perhaps even go look at some of these services. So, you know, perhaps there's a um, you know some type of um, community based services that some provider has, you know, in in your county or in your loved one's county where you might actually want to just go check it out. Like, okay, on paper, this is what this service is supposed to look like. But then when you go there or, you know, or you go there and you're looking at that place for your, you know, with in for your 21 year old and you go and see, you know, lots of 50, what look like 50, 60, 70 year olds, which, you know, nothing against the older folks, but perhaps likely not what you're looking for and what your 21 year old is, is looking for. Um, so, yeah, I really, I don't think there's, there, there's really a good resource um, for that. Not a, oh, go here and you'll find it. Um, I think it, some of it comes more word of mouth and, you know, connections with um, parent groups or, you know, parent support groups who, you know, who are more, you know, who are more familiar. Um, in, but, and as you said, Mallory, in terms of getting into more of like, okay, here's the list of services I clicked on, found that easy enough, you know, here's the over waiver services, you know, or the consolidated waiver services, um, you know, what does that mean? Then, yeah, yeah, you really are. I mean, there are certainly some resources out there, like on the community health choices side, we've developed materials because we have more funding and do a lot more work on the CHC waiver. Um, you know, you could go to our website and find um, information about the waiver and the services covered and more detailed definition of the services. Um, but, and so there are, you know, Disability Rights Pennsylvania, there are other entities that, that likely have, you know, um, information that's easier to access than a three or 400 page waiver. Um, but, you know, sometimes those, those, you know, despite how long those waiver documents are, and there's a link to all of them, you know, on the, on the DHS website, you're looking at the over waiver, you'll see, you know, for the 2022, 2023, whichever most current waiver exists for say the over waiver, you know, click here, um, you know, it, it's a it's a lot, but you're not needing to read all of it. You know, you can if you know how to do like a word search, then yeah, do that control F. Exactly. That magical control F <laughs> and hope it doesn't pull up like, you know, 800 <laughs> connections, you know, to trying to figure out, you know, there's residential services. Well, you know, right. Put in the word red words, residential services, and then it, it, it should link you quicker so mm -hmm. that you at least then see okay, here's some more detail about what residential services look like. And, you know, the waiver provides details of you can get this service with this service, but you can't at the same time, but you can't get this particular service with this particular service at the same time. Um, but I definitely think the missing piece is still, okay, well, who are the providers? How do I know? And who are the providers in my area? Because that's, that's also, I think, the key because class takes all of the OLTL waivers and all of the um, PFDS, community living and consolidated waiver. And I will say the network of providers is very different. Um, while the services are pretty similar, reimbursement rates are a little different and then the network is gonna be your biggest concern. Um, there's, there's a place to search that online. Um, and I think Mary Everard just stuck it in the chat. So, let me check to make sure that's the one that I use, but it can be definitely tough, especially when you're considering, you know, an individual who could have a wait list or have no wait list. You have to think about the provider network. And then if the provider has a wait list, um, sorry, that's not like a simple answer. Uh, no. Yeah. I'm sorry as well. It, yes. It's, you know, and like I said, just, just the question on wait list or no wait list. 
um, because once you're in one waiver, like in the community health choices waiver or the over waiver where there is no waiting list, but you, you start to uncover through learning more, through talking to others more, through networking, that maybe where, you know, your loved one is better suited is in like one of the ID waivers while you're, you know, your loved one has uh, already has a waiver that puts them very low on that priority list to get then an, an ID waiver. Um, okay, and then just, I, we touched on this some earlier already, you know, income limits, resource limit for all of these waiver or waivers are all the same that, you know, in terms of the financial eligibility for these waivers. Um, a, a note though, that, you know, that, it is certainly can be relevant in any individual situation. That $2,742 a month um, income limit for waiver is gross income, period. No deductions. Doesn't matter if it's earned income, unearned income, it's gross income, period. However, if somebody's over that income limit and they are working, and MOD has that higher income limit, and MOD counts the income very differently than just a straight gross income is what it is, um, then people can get onto, a, become financially eligible for a waiver, even if their income's over that 2042 a month, if they're working um, and on MOD, or if they're able to then get onto MOD. Um, but, you know, it, because, because their income is over that 2,742 a month. Lots of folks, including the people that need to know this, they're supposed to know this, like at the county assistance offices, don't always know this. So I just, it was important to kind of throw that out there. Okay. And then he actually, there are the links um, <laughs> to all those um, various waivers. We didn't touch on the ACAP. The ACAP um, is an um, adult community autism program um, that exists in only, I think, about four counties um, in in Pennsylvania. Uh, and, and people have to have an, an, an autism diagnosis. Um, and I apologize because off the top of my head, I don't even remember what the four counties are but certainly worth taking a look at, especially if it happens to be, you live in one of those four counties. And then you have the link to our, 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 our resource library and um, on our website. 